will be kept off. Um, feel free to type in your questions, either in the chat box or in the Q&A box at the center bottom of your screen. Also, please, could you add to your text that uh, which of the panelists you are addressing your question or comment to and whether you would like to speak or you would want us to read out the question and I will do so accordingly. Right, so intellectual history and political thought in recent times has taken a global turn in an attempt to move beyond categories of nation and the modern in historical analysis. The most significant intellectual contributions of these works have been to question the globality of intellectual history traditions and in turn urge scholars to introduce spaces beyond the Anglophone world within the realm of intellectual history as fertile grounds of ideation. These new interventions in the field of intellectual history has unveiled questions on the role of linguistic geopolitics in the writing of intellectual history. This panel seeks to ask and address the ways in which we can write intellectual histories and histories of political thought from non-Anglophone life worlds. Therefore, it will conclusively ask, in what ways can we reimagine the archive and methodologies in an attempt to decolonize the discipline of intellectual history? We'll start today with a super interesting introductory presentation from Professor Miles Larmer, who has very generously agreed to share his research with us today as a part of this workshop. He's a professor of African history at the University of Oxford. He has published widely on the social and political history of Central Africa, particularly Zambia and the DR Congo. His most recent project analyzes the relationship between social change and the production of knowledge in the Central African Copper Belt. His latest book bearing the same title as his talk at the conference today will be published by CUP, Cambridge University Press in September, 2021. Um, Miles' introductory presentation will be followed by uh, three short interventions from our other panelists. Professor Emma Hunter, thank you so much. Emma has uh, agreed to chair and moderate the entire session. Uh, professor Hunter is a professor of global and African history at the University of Edinburgh. She is the author of Political Thought and the Public Sphere, Freedom, Democracy and Citizenship in the Era of Decolonization, published by Cambridge University Press in 2015. Her current project is titled Another World, East Africa and the Global 1960s. I will now let uh, Professor Hunter take on from here. Thank you. Okay, well... Thank you very much um, for that introduction and thank you for inviting me. Um, thank you to, the, to, to you really for organizing this absolutely wonderful conference. It's uh, just full of exciting um, papers and, and discussion and I'm really looking forward to the, this panel. Um, I was really excited by this, this panel and by the opportunity it provides to reflect on how, in the words of the, the panel description, to write intellectual histories and histories of political thought from non-Anglophone life worlds and to think through this together. So our first um, introductory paper, um, as Shivachi has said, is from Mars Lama, who is a professor of African history at the University of Oxford. And his title is Living for the City, Social Change and Knowledge Production in the Central African Copper Belt. Over to you, Miles. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I'm just gonna share screen and, and do a modest uh, PowerPoint. Um, I would briefly say that I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here and having uh, listened to a couple of the previous panels earlier, quite intimidated uh, to be here as well. So I hope this paper speaks uh, usefully to the panel in particular and obviously the conference as a whole. In the mid 20th century, thousands of women moved from diverse communities across Central Africa to new towns. Those women, many joined by their husbands and families, engaged in a range of economic activities, subsistence and commercial farming, informal trade and labour. And over the next decades, as the numbers swelled to tens and hundreds of thousands, they built vibrant communities with new forms of social, cultural and religious identities and association. They and their families had to contend with repression and attempts at political domination by illegitimate authorities, severe fluctuation in the buying power of their customers and the environmental impact of their neighbors' activities on their health, land and economies. That is a history of the Central African Copper Belt that is just as representative as one which is far better known. The dominant history of the Copper Belt is of male migration for wage labor, to new Western-owned industrial mines, underwritten by the empires that drew their borders and enabled the, the exploitation of their wealth. <laughs> Male migrants, this history tells us, brought their families to new company towns where they founded their <laughs> associations, 
political parties and labor unions and where they secured improved living standards funded by the revenue generated by expanding mineral production. With national independence came mine nationalization, but that was followed by economic decline linked to falling mineral prices, uh, and the late 20th century saw corrupt privatization and in the DR Congo, military conflicts which accelerated the collapse of these communities. I'm just gonna stop briefly because I'm having a problem moving my PowerPoint on. And just try that again. Okay, for some reason I'm unable to move the PowerPoint on at the moment. I'm going to I'm going to just stop screen sharing for a sec because I think that um, that isn't going to work. So let me stop that for now. Now that latter history I've given you dominates our imagination of the Copper Belt for a number of reasons. The region mattered for global capital and policymakers insofar as it produced strategic minerals. It came to their attention when its residents rioted, struck work and organized politically, disrupting mineral flows and threatening control over it. For social scientists, some funded by and some critical of mine companies and states, this version, that latter version of the Copper Belt, provided evidence of social change enabled by modernization change requiring careful management and policy intervention. And research by the Rhodes Livingston Institute and in Congo by SEPSI, the Centre d'études des problèmes sociaux indigènes, disseminated an idea of a distinct African urban modernity conceived of in entirely Western terms. Later, the Copper Belt provided a cautionary tale of skewed development, unsustainable consumption, and over-dependence on mineral resources. And by the 1980s, this once hyper-modern space was a dinosaur in need of external aid and reform. And now donors and social scientists explained the failure of Copper Belt modernity and charted its residents' efforts to manage decline, as well as their nostalgia for better times. If those external characterizations were the only reason for the hegemony of that second one-sided vision of Copper Belt society and the marginalization of the historical experiences I highlighted at the start, then my aim would be to displace it by a sustained consideration of untold Copper Belt stories, adding to the record in hidden or invisible histories of, among other things, informal communities, cross-border identities, pollution, and women's work, the largest group of workers on this quintessentially urban copper belt have always been female farmers. And this project does do that by extending the social history of this region, the Central African Copper Belt, to topics that have not been the sustained focus of scholarly and institutional attention, intellectual history, or as I'm terming it, elite knowledge production. And yet, the dominant history of the Copper Belt, of men and mining, politics and economics, boom and bust, modernity and its fall, is also the history that has been and is still narrated by Copper Belt residents to social scientists and to each other. A mythic modernist narrative, despite its distorting, its distortion of the complex open-ended realities of history, still underwrites the region's dominant political and social and cultural discourses. While happily rejected by all right-thinking post-colonial social scientists, these narratives of transition from rural village life to modern town have underpinned and still underpin political aspirations, protesters' demands, and cultural expression in the forms of songs and paintings and dance by generations of Copper Belt musicians and artists. So of the Anglophone intellectual approach and its distorting and silencing effects, but also the nature, the reality of how Copper Belt communities produce their own knowledge, which differs from that binary of tradition modernity in subtle and important ways, but nonetheless articulates what I would call a modernist narrative from below. Those communities do that because in my view, they're not, uh, not because they're enthralled to a hegemonic derivative discourse, but rather because they have their own reasons for doing so, both ideational and, and practical. And so this study presents an intertwined history of Copper Belt society and the production of knowledge about the society and argues that from the start, popular and elite ideas about the region have been interconnected, mutually constitutive, while profoundly unequal in reach and influence. 
In the remaining time I have, I want to explain how the study seeks in this way to contribute to the theme of the panel, the decolonization of intellectual history, particularly in regard to sub-Saharan sub African history. And I'm aware, really, that the acutely aware in this gathering that the pioneering work of South Asian historians from the sub balkan Studies School up to much of the work presented here today has addressed many of these concerns over, I think, a much longer time frame. And I really would value presenting here today feedback, critical feedback, on the extent to which this approach sounds all too familiar to you, the extent to which it chimes or challenges with the ways you approach the relationship between social change and the history of ideas. To state the obvious, intellectual historians of modern Africa have sought in varied ways over the past two, two decades to overcome the challenge of the derivative discourse from Chatterjee that African thinkers, political activists and academics operated in a colonial or neo-colonial context in which the dominant intellectual ideas through which they sought to liberate their societies were themselves dominated by Western thought, ideational norm and European discourses in which one could only imagine or articulate freedom, liberation through a set of Western or colonial tongues, measures or markers of progress. And Africanists have addressed this challenge in many ways, for example, demonstrating the interconnected Black Atlantic milieu that linked Edward Blyden to Du Bois, 19th century Angola to Brazil, and Francophone thinkers from Césaire to Sangor to Fanon. Others have analysed the fertile imaginings of literate elites who established public spheres in Western and Eastern Africa, and Professor Hunter is a leading thinker in this area on how local languages enabled colonised Tanzanians to utilise alternative discourses of freedom outside a Eurocentric framework. And others have traced African intellectual traditions back to a deeper past in a pre-colonial past in which political and spiritual advisors and powers recorded, not always in oral form, the history and ideas of African societies. So there are many approaches that can be taken to this question. But I think all of these are relatively less useful for a region like the Copper Belt, created largely from scratch for the purpose of Western colonial exploitation and extraction, where cosmopolitan urban societies created new syncretic cultures and adapted existing languages for cultural and political expression. Here, mobility of these forms was limited by outright racial segregation, limited access to Western education, and even into the late colonial period, few opportunities for economic or occupational or political advance. And such opportunities as they were, were framed explicitly in a discourse of advancement in strictly Western terms, symbolized most powerfully by that Belgian categorization of Western educated Africans as evolue, those who had demonstrated sufficient evolution, not only in Western education, but in all aspects of their life, religious belief, clothing, social and sexual behavior. How then does one present an intellectual history of this society that's not simply a history of Western thought and practice? My answer really lies in the in Copper Belt society's sense of its own self. In his landmark study of Zambian Copper Belt society, Expectations of Modernity, the anthropologist James Ferguson discusses the challenge of comprehending from an ethnographic perspective a community closely linked to the global, the global economy and characterized by migration and cosmopolitanism. Copper Belt residents understood their society as um, involving uh, socioeconomic change and explained it using local dialects of a language of urban modernity that dominated modernist social science and was the subject of Ferguson's own critique. And this has been my own experience. I've been visiting the region for 30 years now and it's it was clear from the start that Zambian Copper Belt residents articulate the nature of their society and the ways it's changed in really sociological ways. There's, they argue, is a modern urban place where development has created multi-ethnic societies in which tribal conflict, tribal conflict is unthinkable. We stress the centrality of the money economy, breadwinners' uh, responsibilities for immediate family and wider kinship networks. Comparisons between people, society, areas and periods are articulated in a way that draws on this popular modernist discourse. A couple of micro examples of many from my research. Leonard and Kua compares two Zambian towns in the 1950s, quote, Chapata was not well developed compared to Luantia, whose minds were better developed with infrastructure. 
Chapasa relied on farmers, so it was less well developed. Across the border in Okatanga, Diodone Kalenga explains the appeal of artwork depicting village life as, quote, works that evoke the reality of the traditional world, our ancestors, life in our traditional society. Copperbelt residents had have had for many decades multiple long-standing contacts with researchers whose ideas about the Copper Belt have been shaped by these residents and whose own perceptions have permeated local understandings. This is a community that's always explained itself to the wider world in self-conscious ways that focus on its distinctive novel character relative to the rural societies from which most residents or their parents or today their grandparents migrated. So this distinct copper belt urbanity was an idea both articulated by and internalized by residents to help them make sense of their changing social reality and make claims about it. This was how these societies sought to assert their understanding of history as central to their attempts to decolonize and liberate their society. Social scientific research made available new technologies, a new repertoire of claim making narratives. African communities provided policymakers and social scientists with the raw material for their understanding of social change, but they had their own diverse ideas about social advance, which, however, they often articulated in forms that resonated with those in power over them, who they sought to influence. As one key example, in the 1950s, more senior, educated African mine workers consciously shaped researchers' access to an understanding of their communities in order to emphasize respectability and readiness for political advancement. The language of urban social change, civilization, citizenship, respectability, modernity, development, infused individual and collective expressions of Copper Belt communities and informed the ways they explained the relationship between past, present, and future. Now, just to illustrate this a bit more, this popular discourse took related but different forms in the two regions I'm talking about. In Congo's Odkatanga mining towns, the authoritarian paternalism of the mining company Union Minière and the Belgian state influenced a relatively benign perspective of many residents. To simplify, they saw and see themselves as the beneficiaries of company largesse, but equally recognized that personal progress, familial progress through the system was in the hands of ethnic intermediaries and strongly dependent on patronage. In Zambia, there was, there is today nostalgia for a company system, but socioeconomic progress for communities was, it was believed, more the result of residents' actions collectively in labor organization or individually via hard work than of company patronage and welfare. In other words, a similar exploitative economic system was understood differently by these two communities, which then sought to act on it differently. Okay, through, through this kind of approach to my research questions, I'm interested in unlocking what I think is a central problem of social history in an era of post-colonial thought. And I'm gonna put this incredibly simply, so bear with me. To put it crudely, for much of the 20th century, historians and social scientists saw society as an essentially material reality to be measured, observed and recorded. Innovative methodologies, quantitative data collection, interviews and oral testimony were developed to overcome the problems, limits of state archives, but it was generally assumed to be possible and necessary to capture an approximation of social reality. Since the 1970s, historians have become acutely aware of the ways in which knowledge production by imperial actors about non-Western societies was vital to implementing and justifying colonial projects. Central to colonialism in Africa was information gathering, production, classification. And this affected how researchers accessed and approached the archive. For the Copper Belt, James Ferguson, and for Udkatanga, Benjamin Rubers have explained the focus on knowledge production on this key question, how could Africans adapt to modern society, was central to social change and academic representation. But the limits of post-colonial theory are, I think, relevant here. Arguably, it shifted attention away from colonized societies and towards knowledge producers, privileging their place in the historical record, even while critiquing their impact. And it also tended, I think, to create a division between an evidently artificial distorted imperial history shown to be implicitly false and an intrinsically authentic subaltern social reality 
that whether documented or not was still out there waiting to be found. If, however, we appreciate that knowledge production in its varied forms is the way that communities make sense of and advance claims in relation to history, that it is actually what social history is for most people, then we can potentially address that division. That's not to, den that's to deny neither the realities of material injustice or exploitation, nor the distortions resulting from Western dominated forms of knowledge production. But I want to argue that in historicizing the meanings attributed to these realities by both elites and Copper Belt residents, documenting how they've changed over time, identifying interaction between structurally unequal, but nonetheless equally energetic producers of knowledge, we can better appreciate how historical meaning comes to be attributed to social reality. Having made those claims, I want to now step away from uh, the grandness of some of it. Um, this is not a study that seeks to reconstruct all the instances where academic researchers and African communities encountered and exchanged ideas about Copper Belt societies. There are such direct encounters, and I can talk about those, but there are equally many instances where elite and popular knowledge production about specific topics reached definitely distinct conclusions. Gender is an obvious one. Social scientists, policymakers, and mine companies believed rural migrant uh, women who migrated from rural areas were essentially unmodern, but equally believed that the right training would turn them into respectable housewives, equipped to socialize the next generation. Meanwhile, virtually unnoticed urban women went about the business of running households, but equally running small businesses and large farms. Farms barely noticed because they were judged out of place in town, but absolutely vital to family incomes and diets. Equally, of course, the majority of these knowledge producers, having engaged with Copper Belt communities while gathering knowledge, disseminated it only to their Western and later African academic colleagues, governments, and other elite audiences, doing little to disseminate it to those communities. But awareness of those elite bodies of knowledge leaked out to Copper Belt actors and were taken up opportunistically to reinforce identities and advance claims. So the aim is to capture and historicize an intellectual ecosystem in which ideas about the Copper Belt circulated rather than in modern parlance to track and trace the, all the specific examples of ideation or transmission. And nor is this really a study, a fully realized intellectual study of all the dozens, hundreds of elite producers of knowledge whose work are discussed or touched upon. The aim is really to shift the center of intellectual history from its privileged usually Western perspective, to the field of production, to analyze successive intellectual historical contexts within which both popular and elite knowledge production took place. So I'm intentionally collapsing a conventional barrier that separates the producers of knowledge from the subjects of it. Many of the academics and researchers whose works are analyzed are treated as both authorities about and actors in the history of knowledge production. Now, I would like to show you my the way I do this in the book through the PowerPoint, but I'll try and just describe it briefly in the time I have remaining. I have a set of chapters that are both tightly thematic, primarily thematic and loosely chronological, each focusing on a specific representation of the Copper Belt that emerged in a particular time in the region's history and which was during that period relatively important or even hegemonic in the academic study and in different ways in the popular imagination. Very broadly, I move from a sort of political and economic framework through a gender history, through a cultural history approach, uh, taking into account the spatial turn and coming later to more environmental histories uh, and, and, uh, and the anthropocenic turn. That doesn't mean that each intellectual paradigm was simply replaced by its successor. I treat historiographical change like geological sedimentation. It's useful from a mining way of thinking about things. Geological sedimentation lays down layers and historiogra historiography lays down layers of understanding representation, partly buried through successive approaches, but still accessible to later generations. And a revealing example of this, I think, is environmental damage. Chapter nine of the book focuses on the emission of sulfur dioxide and waste from mining, affecting the health and well-being of Copper Belt mine residents and, and, and local societies from the start. But unlike workplace health, uh, regulated by states and ILO conventions, it attracted little attention. 
mine companies successfully offshored the issue and avoided responsibility for its effects. And it was also absent from most academic research or policy or political attention. For copper belt residents, what they called center or kachuma, sulfur dioxide pollution was an everyday hazard. But while that might have led to discontent, it didn't generate overt protest or find its way into community or union meetings until the late 1980s, when extractive pollution, the subject of concern in Western countries, took the form of environmental impact assessments. And that provided a, a discursive framework within which Copper Belt communities could now express and mobilize around pollution. But that was a, essentially around contemporary mining. What happened to who would pay the damage for pollution inflicted by companies and political regimes in the past? That example suggests that for any particular set of actors at a particular time, a historical framework can be uncovered and re-excavated as the basis for claim making. A key example here is the politicization of ethnic difference in Old Katanga. In the 1960s, Katangi secessionists resisted growing power uh, authority of Kasayan migrants to mining towns by constructing a Katangese national identity rooted in a reading of a pre-colonial past in which powerful kingdoms generated wealth by copper mining. And that led to violence and repression against Kasayan residents of mine towns. For many decades, that, uh, those tensions, that ethnic associational idea was quiescent in Katangi society. But in the early 1990s, as President Mobutu's regime faced growing opposition, it was excavated, a deliberately a deliberate excavation by local political movements, leading to the killing of 5,000 people and the displacement of a million more. Ethnic violence of that kind has never occurred in Zambia and is, from the perspective of our interviewees, unthinkable. But it's clear that there's nothing structural that leads to that. It's simply that for a region whose population is self-consciously cosmopolitan, the idea of over-ethnic mobilization as the basis of politics has, at least until recently, been illegitimate. A couple of points in conclusion. We, we in this research, historicize uh, a vast body of academic research on the region. We access substantial new archival research, and we've carried out hundreds of interviews, both with long-term residents of the region, but also specific actors, social welfare officers, musicians, visual artists. Following the argument I've made, interviewees are, interviews are regarded as performative events. Interviews, interviewees like their predecessors are articulating their understanding of the region's history in relation to their personal experience, but also their perception of our intentions and background as interviewers and the potential of the interview to advance their situation. I am running out of time, so I won't talk more about um, the way we treat popular texts, but we engage with popular texts, including those written by political activists, but also letters to agony aunts, the song lyrics of musicians, all of which comment on the nature of urban society in terms of custom, family life and sexual relations. I want to finally, finally say in conclusion that this is an only one approach, uh, it one, only one way in which the intellectual history of Africa can be decolonized, and I think the diversity of papers in this panel suggests the very different ways in which this can be done. And as we move forward and address this question, I think that's key. We must seek to address this question in quite open-ended, imaginative and diverse ways. And I hope that this brief presentation gives you some idea about what I've been trying to do with this research. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Great, thank you very much indeed, uh, Miles. And we're going to go straight on into the next um, presentations and then we'll have um, the, the discussion at the end. Um, and I think I'm sure about, do we have about 12 minutes or so? Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. Um, so the, the first of our um, the shorter papers um, is um, from GVGK Tang, um, who is a public historian. Um, and with a background in uh, transnational queer politics. Um, they hold a BA in history and sociology with a minor in LBGT studies and an MA in public history with a concentration in digital humanities and media studies from Temple University. Tang has been published by Oxford University Press, the, uh, the Smithsonian Society of American Archivists and Transnational Queer Underground. They co-chair the Society for Queer Asian Studies and serve on the Diversity and Inclusion Task Force of the National Council on Public History. And their title is We Are Everywhere, 
on decolonizing the queer canon. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna share my screen, hopefully it works. Can everybody see? Is it good? Yeah, we can see, but it's blank. Is that is it no, meant to be? Yes, yeah. <laughs> great. <laughs> All right. Um, much of human sexuality has played out behind the bedroom door of history, private and concealed. The evidentiary basis for such history is scant. How can we expand how these histories can be told given the gaps and silences of the archive? We must always consider who or what is missing from our narratives and why. We must remain cognizant of who produced and preserved what evidence, when, where, and why, and how it has been and will be understood by new generations and audiences, because this information shapes and comprises extant narratives of sexuality. In his seminal 1983 essay, Capitalism and Gay Identity, American historian John D'Amelio wrote of gay liberation in the late 60s. In building a movement without a knowledge of our history, we instead invented a mythology. In reading backwards queer Anglo experiences, activists haphazardly assigned modern identities to the sexual past and sought to derive a progressive political narrative. Historians continue to contend with this misapplication of terminology, gay, homosexual, and queer. My paper examines texts that comprise the so-called queer Anglo canon in an effort to destabilize the universalizing pretensions of Western epistemology. I explored how Anglo historians' interpretations of queer sexuality developed since the 1970s, how larger historiographic trends and social contexts influenced them, what their sources were, and how they were used. By tracing queer historiography's genealogy, I found that presentist and Anglo-centric terminology emerged as part of a larger trend shaped by historians' own milieu. This last element, primary sources and their interpretation, is the focus of my presentation today in an effort to illustrate and contextualize my larger argument. Scholars must emphasize relevant temporal and geographic contexts and allow narratives of non-normative eroticism to merge on their own with their own language and self-conception. In doing so, we may decolonize the so-called queer canon. Excavating seemingly non-existent primary source materials informed nascent queer historiography. Anglo historians often located colonial queers using court records. Their histories were based on narratives of pain and persecution. Jonathan Ned Katz's 1976 Gay American History was a collection of primary source materials. Opening with a plethora of 16th and 17th century American executions preceded by the proclamation these documents portray lesbians and gay men enmeshed in a variety of difficult situations, an oppressed and troubling presence with whom America has yet to deal with justice. Katz's commentary on the subjugation of homosexuals belied the content of his sources, testimonies and rulings that only alluded to sodomy and buggery. Katz not only failed to define his terms, but he also neglected to distinguish between punished behavior and persecuted identity. By interpreting the behaviors described in these documents as persecuted identities like gay or homosexual, Katz and other early queer Anglo historians read individual subjects into a collective teleology. In doing so, they neglected their subjects agency or the capacity of these individuals to construct their own sexual scripts. Nor did they consider how colonial queers conceived of themselves and their situations. Modern identity politics replaced relevant context. Queer Anglo historians glossed over the gaps and silences of the queer colonial archive and didn't dare ask seemingly unanswerable questions about colonial queers' conflicting desires, behaviors, and self-conceptions. They opted to fill in the blanks with anachronistic certainties, giving voice instead of seeking it. Take, for example, Michael Wigglesworth, a 17th century Puritan minister known for his best-selling poem, The Day of Doom. An ardent Christian, father, and husband three times over, Wigglesworth struggled with his sexuality. We know this not because of court records, but because of his encoded diary entries. I find my spirit so exceeding carried with love to my pupils that I can't tell how to take up my rest in God. Lord, for this cause, I am afraid of my wicked heart. Fear takes hold of me, nothing but vanity and vexation of spirit. <laughs> 
1970, Wigglesworth's diary was deciphered and published. We could debate the ethics of this, but even with deeply personal testimony available to us, historians have often deemed him gay or prudish because of his attraction to his students at Harvard and his shame about nocturnal emissions. In order to responsibly interpret Wigglesworth's history, we must differentiate between his inner thoughts and desires evinced in his diary, from his actions, marriage and children, and identity or lack thereof. We must also ask how he experienced his sexuality as well as how it might've been read by others. Did Wigglesworth identify himself as part of a nameless underclass of sodomites persecuted by society or as a sinner comparable to a drunkard or an adulterer? Is the seeming incongruity between Wigglesworth's desires and behavior something to be read as a lack of self-acceptance by today's standards or a spiritual struggle by Wigglesworth's own perspective? Modern identifiers like gay or homosexual um, carry their own social, cultural, and political weight. Early modern Americans did not necessarily conceive of their sexual desires and behaviors as separate from the other components of self, spiritual, cultural, or social. However, the historiography continually fails to account for a non-identity-based interpretation of queer eroticism. After all, how do you give name to the nameless? In her groundbreaking work, Thieving Sugar, Omasheka and Natasha Tinsley argued the many vocabularies possible under the umbrella women who love women work to dismantle the closet by decentering it. By, positing this, by positioning this trope in a spectrum of constructions of sexuality in which Mati, Zanmi, Bulldagger, or lesbian all carry their own cultural and historical weight. Language has always had the capacity to both limit and expand our epistemologies. Historiography is loaded with Anglo terminology like gay, homosexual, and queer. Non-normative intimacies can never truly be articulated without the language of a given people and their context, both time and place. In juxtaposition with Katz's own discourse of so-called gay Native Americans, indigenous peoples were often condemned as sodomites by European colonizers, withholding the assumption that indigenous peoples were in fact partaking in queer behaviors as historians had before, Jonathan Goldberg in his 1992 book, Sodometries, demonstrated Europeans use such language to justify invasion and atrocity. It does not tell us anything about the sexual practices of indigenous peoples and only serves as a spectacle for Europe and its ruses of power. Innumerable queer Anglo historians had replicated these colonial profanities, rendering indigenous perspectives illegible. The use of gay to describe two spirit pe people obscured the interplay of gender and sexuality for indigenous identities. Yes, a crow woman fought with three stars on the rosebud. Two of them did, for that matter. But one of them was neither a man nor a woman. She looked like a man, and yet she wore woman's clothing. And she had the heart of a woman. Besides, she did a woman's work. Her name was finds them and kills them. Oshtish was the keeper of the body tradition, a male-bodied person in the crow community who lived their daily life in a feminine role. Earning her name finds them and kills them in a fight against the Lakota, Oshtish was a revered member of her tribe who had a lodge, a family, and was considered a leader among the Bade. In the late 1890s, an American agent incarcerated Oshtish and other Bades and forced them to present as men and do manual labor. Oshtish's community rallied for her and other Bade's release, which was ultimately granted. Two-spirit peoples were not queer in the context of their respective tribes. They were only read as such by European outsiders. Indigenous activists have since pushed for the use of historical tribe-specific names or the presentist pan-Indian identity of two-spirit. Though the latter term is anachronistic and an Anglo translation, one may note how presentism can be wielded to revise and respond to the Anglo-centric canon, as illustrated by the two ahistorical images on the right. Similarly, the Chinese identifier Tongzi was specifically adopted to counter Anglo constructs like gay, homosexual, or queer. Conceivably, even if Tongzi is a modern identity, it could be adapted to Chinese historiographies more readily than queer, which is not only presentist, but Anglo in origin. These misapplications challenge the universalizing pretensions of queer theory, not just because of linguistic barriers, but because of sociocultural foundations, as Washan Chao explains in his seminal 2000 work, Tongzi. However, other scholars argue that queer is not necessarily conceptually derivative of Anglo sexuality, 
but is in fact an Anglo translation of pre-existing Chinese scholarship. Indeed, anyone writing in Chinese on queer topics is assumed to be working with a translated Anglo concept rather than articulating an original thought, according to Petrus Liu. Chinese queer theorists argue that their task is ultimately the globalization of queer theories and histories, contrary to the basis of Tongzi identity. China may or may not need queer theory, but queer theory needs to be expanded, supplemented, and revised by what is Chinese. Positioning himself at a cross-section of anti-colonial and pro-queer politics, some Sha Sha Pen Chinese language treatises, the first of their kind, beginning with a Chinese gays manifesto in 1980. He also published Hong Kong's first underground gay newsletter, Pink Triangle, beginning in 1981. There isn't even an exact term for homosexual in Chinese history, and we certainly don't have any precedent for the concept gay. So when we come out in Chinese society, we are under a Western shadow. I mean, 150 years ago, if I had wanted to have sex with men, there wouldn't have been any problem. Soon, decriminalization of sodomy in Hong Kong was no longer the colonial government's promotion of a perverted agenda in service of white gay elites, as some had argued. Uh, for some Tongzi activists, it became an honorable gesture of democracy at the moment of retrocession or the handover of Hong Kong from Britain to China in 1997. Localized identities directly oppose Anglocentrism and queer historiography because as in all transnational and cross-lingual surveys of sexuality, translation is an act of approximation and cultural connotation is never fully captured. This politicized sexual meaning making is born of a post-colonial context. The expanding geographic scope of queer Anglo historiographies necessitates both a broadened vocabulary and a critical understanding of what constitutes queerness how gender and sexuality are sometimes one and the same, and how various forms of intimacies and identities may be othered in a given context. In doing so, we must also challenge ourselves to expand what comes to mind when we think of queer history, and in turn, what sorts of materials and stories can be included in our narrative production. In her article, Venus in Two Acts, Sadia Hartman deconstructs the archive of Atlantic slavery. She asks, is it possible to exceed or negotiate the constitutive limits of the archive? To tell an impossible story and to amplify the impossibility of its telling. By representing divergent stories from contested points of view, I have attempted to jeopardize the status of the event to displace the received or authorized account. By exploiting the transparency of sources as fictions, I hope to illuminate the contested character of history, narrative, event, and fact to engulf authorized speech in the clash of voices. Narrative restraint, the refusal to fill in the gaps and provide closure is a requirement of this method. This practice is not to give voice. It is a history of an unrecoverable past, what might have been or could have been written with and against the archive. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. And and thank you for such exemplary timekeeping. I was perfectly to time. Um, so we'll move straight on um, to the next um, paper. And then, as I said before, we'll have a discussion at the end. So um, our next paper is Khadija Chagai from the Economa Supérieure de Bouzaria, um, Algiers, Algeria. Um, and she is assistant professor and lecturer at the um, uh, at the Economa Supérieure for the Letters and Humanities um, of Bouzaria, Algiers, Algeria, and a PhD candidate in her last stage of research in comparative literature and interdisciplinary studies at uh, Mouloud Mameri uh, University, Algeria. Khadija lectures on African literature and civilization, post-colonial literature, medieval and Renaissance European history, and intercultural studies. Her research interests in areas range from post-colonial literature, comparative literature, literature and theology, and the history of thought generally conceived. Um, Khadija Chagai is a 2018 visiting scholar and fellow at New York University's Multinational Institute of American Studies, MIAS, on US culture and society, and an active participant in many international scientific conferences and events. And her title is A Constellation of Delirium, The Crisis of Rewriting Algeria's Intellectual History. Over to you. I think you're on mute. <laughs> 
it's fine. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for having me with you uh, today and uh, giving me a chance to share my uh, humble research. Um, so as the uh, title of my presentation uh, might give you an idea is that I'm, I will be uh, kind of bringing about my reflections on the crisis of writing, rewriting Algeria's intellectual history, because sometimes you speak about writing and rewriting. Why rewriting? Because what was written before is uh, kind of surrounded by many uh, misunderstandings, mislocations, and uh, and looking at what's going on now um, at many Algerian institutions and uh, schools of um, the uh, knowledge of production, uh, very little is really uh, being uh, spotlighted or brought to, uh, to the general uh, public understanding. So uh, before I go deeper into the main points of my presentation, I'm gonna start with, uh, with a quote by the post-colonial um, Cameroonian uh, African scholar, Ashini Bimbe in his work on the post-colony that reflects very well on the linguistic, uh, historiographical and um, uh, political uh, kind of uh, ambiguities and uh, misunderstandings surrounding the post-colonial African discourse, uh, where he reflects on the uh, reliability of the post-colonial uh, social theory and reflecting upon what he calls the collapse of the world or what he calls the uh, post-colonial experience as compared to the, uh, to the, uh, the Western experience or uh, to what he calls the meta narratives, or what kind of knowledge was produced before, and compared to the one that many scholars were engaged with in a post colonial context. So he uh, asks many questions. So one of these questions is that he says, Sorry, but what is missing in there? Inflecting upon the post colonial subject, what is missing in there? So what is missing in there? Far from the dead ends, the random observations, and the false dilemmas, in any sign of radical questioning. For what Africa as a concept calls fundamentally into question is the manner in which social theory has hitherto reflected on the problem of the collapse of the worlds, their fluctuations and tremblings, their about turns, their disguises, their silences and murmurings. Social theory has failed also to account for time as lived not synchronically or diachronically, but in its multiplicity and simultaneities, its presence and absences beyond the lazy categories of permanence and change. And these are just part of the questions that he asked and which can very well relate to my topic. If my topic today is the crisis of writing of Algeria's intellectual history, which, is, which finds itself in the middle of many fluctuating narratives. One or each narrative tries to pull it into a certain camp uh, with little evidence or historical evidence or archival research being provided as a as an alternative, uh, as an alternative, if we can say, uh, vision or alternative um, uh, version of how uh, to tell the story. So a constellation of Belurian here, which is taken from Fonce Fanon, means that writing Algeria or Algerian history itself lives in a, a crisis of fluctuation between different narratives, a Middle Eastern narrative, a Western French narrative, and Sub-Saharan African narrative. And when we speak about Algeria, Compared to many other countries, Algeria lies at the heart of different civilizations, a, a Mediterranean civilization that takes its kind of um, featuring characteristics from a, uh, a European sound, from a Middle Eastern culture, uh, from a Sub-Saharan culture, and from a Muslim Christian culture, uh, from, a, uh, from a very long history of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, narratives, everyone adding its own contribution to what we call the African, uh, the Algerian subject, the Algerian individual, but still a uh, little is being there discovered or, um, or found out to support each uh, narrative or each theory. So in here, uh, what I wanna bring um, or highlight uh, mainly today is the idea of Algerian history, like many other post-colonial histories, uh, which is subject of endless, un, endless debate, sorry, competing visions dominating the scene of writing Algeria's history with each drawing its speculations. And these speculations sometimes are backed by historical or accurate historical data, but twisted to serve certain ideologies because when we speak about an, uh, a post-colonial history, we speak about neo-colonial practices, new realities, uh, different types of narratives, divided ideologies, every narrative serving a certain ideology, the place of politics in determining what's to be written, what's not to be written, 
The role of intelligentsia, which was mostly, uh, of course, uh, limited, was not given the freedom it has to be given to engage in any kind of historiographical or an archival research. So it is kind of fluctuating between, as I said, different visions, each backed up by accurate historical data, but twisted to serve certain ideologies. And in some or other cases, some narratives which lack both historical accuracy and realistic resonance with the actual Algerian history about what best describes the modern or contemporary Algerian individual in terms of culture, language, race, origin, and contribution to the human civilization. So what is there now in most, in most kind of libraries or museums, what we find here, there, we find kind of personal engagements on the part of some researchers who wanted to kind of free the responsibility of engaging with the post-colonial Algerian, uh, Algerian, I'm sorry, history. Uh, but most of them, as I call them in my, in my paper, they were abortive attempts. Uh, they were sometimes listened to, they were sometimes supported. Uh, sometimes they were uh, kind of forbidden from uh, saying what they wanted to say. That's why most of them ended up joining uh, the uh, academic effort uh, from abroad uh, of Algeria for not to mingle more and more in the political context. Um, so, um, what we find now mostly in the Algerian uh, historical scene is that many attempts, most of them, as they said, abortive by some committed forces at stimulating public interest in what really happened, or at least convince people of the necessity to investigate one's position amidst the evolving cycle of world histories. So uh, the problem in here, when we speak about Algerian history, and many questions come to the fore, is that what really represents the Algerian amidst all of these narratives? what really presents the Algerian, uh, what we kind of bring to the fore to speak really about intellectual Algerian history with its historical cultural linguistic dimensions. So one is always constantly faced with the same questions related to the historical memory, archives, intellectual property, who really owns the, the word to say it about our Algerian history, the role of the post-colonial subject, the role of the contemporary revisionist, retrospective narrative. I'm calling it revisionist, revisionist because it's not adding any uh, anything to what was already said during the very first days after independence. And 60 years or 62 years after independence, there was no much brought up for in terms of personal engagement and the role of politics in defining what is to be written, what is not to be written. So uh, key questions always unfold here uh, when we speak about Algeria's history is that who speaks or can speak about Algeria's past according to whose version or to whose account and to what kind of readership, the local readership or the international readership because history will be perceived differently, of course. And is there an Algerian school of historiography which can be entrusted with the task of keeping the historical memory for all that it holds alive and relevant. So this research is a, a kind of rather investigative. Uh, it, try, it tries to shed light on, uh, on the, this uh, crisis of writing Algeria's intellectual history, uh, it, which is in a process of finding a voice and taking shape and amidst all of these, um, all of these issues. So, uh, here, it is worth saying that Algeria's history has for a long time struggled to find voice as its added validity amidst the cycle of global entanglements. Algeria's intellectual history and what defines it as memory, archives, and historiography has always been negotiated in what Franz Fallon calls a constellation of delirium, that state of oscillation between various often opposed narratives between center and periphery, which means the Algerian center at the, the ex-French colonial center, and sometimes betwixt multiple centers. Um, and this is due to the fact that a large part of Algeria's history was written in France and much historical material is still produced in there on the part of Algerian academics who decided for one reason or another to join that effort of the French colonial school of historiography. Therefore, the only venue, for example, an Algerian uh, individual now or a student of, of Algerian history, whether he's an Algerian or a foreign, for example, can take to understand what exactly defines Algeria's history or Algerianity as a, uh, a characteristic is to end up faced with one version of historiographical output, that of the French historical uh, school in Algeria and its neo-colonial offshoots. So in here, the colonial school and its adherents tried to frame Algeria's history according to 19th century and early 20th century 
assumptions about the role of the French colonial enterprise in saving the indigenous Algerian subject, perceived to be without history or a story to tell, from the shackles of Ottoman and Muslim dominance under the umbrella of civilizing, Christianizing, and Europeanizing the indigenous, uh, the indigenous uh, subject or the Algerian uh, subject. And on the, other, uh, on the other side, we find that uh, in the 1930s, 1940s, which means approximately 20 years before independence, there were more rising enthusiastic voices, more committed voices, which tried to write Algeria's history through the Algerian eyes. Writings about history, cultural values, political structures, besides other aspects, both in French and Arabic, uh, by people like Mohammed bin Mubarak Kamili, Ahmed Shafiq Madin, who are very famous Algerian uh, scholars, who wanted and worked hard to clear the writing of Algeria's history from the allegations and misrepresentations of the colonial school and frame it according to narratives shaped by more patriotic initiatives. However, these patriotic engagements with their various degrees of partiality, of, 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 uh, of uh, scientific uh, accuracy, ended up in a vacuum for writing back to empire at the time was not that but very much concern for uh, for a country like Algeria that was striving to find its uh, existence as a culture that should not be compared to the other cultures to find voice but a culture that has to have a voice on its own uh, based on its own local narratives based on its own uh, values of, of local indigenous um, knowledge of production without uh, establishing any references. That's why in here, uh, my perspective as a, as both a student and as an Algerian, as a post-colonial subject, as a post-modern subject, is that to decolonize Algeria's history from the shackles of, of what we call the maybe modernity in its very um, concise uh, understanding from the, the meta-narratives, uh, to free it from the idea of the ability to see everything from nowhere. Um, and this reminds me of uh, the scientific historian Donna Haraway, who speaks about the situated knowledge that studying post-colonial histories has to be historically situated, contextually situated, to have a version of history as it is and a history as it, as it not should be, which means to be a kind of faithful to uh, lo local narratives. That's why in here, uh, according to my understanding and to what I see and align in my voice with many, uh, with many other scholars, uh, about Algerian culture and history is that there should be, or to decolonize Algeria's history, there should be, or there is a need for a methodical, when I say methodical, which means there should be a certain historiographical methodology, a method methodical story, which is unbiased, non-amateur, and contextualized trajectory of rewriting Algerian intellectual history to bring it back to track through first reconsidering historical periodization of Algeria's history as one lion at the crossroads of different civilizational contacts, reaching back to the Roman, Arab, and Ottoman eras. And the way has to be paved, therefore, to more neat linearity and teleological models which bracket together everything non-European as missing out on antiquity and forces European history itself into a narrative of dubious progressive changes. And there should be models which have to be replaced by a historiography which takes a more flexible approach to periodization. So the problem is with periodization because what we were taught at school as Algerian students is a history that starts from 1830, which means from the beginning of a French colonial enterprise in Algeria. What was beyond is not really in there. We don't know much about. Uh, we feel that we are lost. Even though when we question, we don't receive answers. That's why even though we are on, 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 on 2021, but still the same question is going on with very few answers being, being provided. And even these answers are not really very, very well uh, convincing. So while some accounts trace Algeria's history to the coming of Arabs and Islam, and therefore looking at the modern Algerian nation as an extension of Islamic and Arab glory and achievements, the colonial school says that an accountable Algerian history started to take shape since 1830 with the presence of the European in, in uh, Algeria. Nothing changed or is changing yet regarding this conflicting set of historical narratives. The second point is that there is also a need to limit the influence of amateurish historiography as a source of data, which was by time accorded the status of validity. So in the study or his study on the history of the Maghreb and Algeria, 
The historian Abdullah Lerwi argues that the writings of the colonial period revolved around one recurring concept, which is the misfortune of the greater Maghreb or North African. It's, it's more misfortune because it did not appreciate the civilizational value of the Roman existence and because it accepted Islam and was subjected to the Hilal invasion. And then because it became a base for the Ottoman piracy and goes on a claiming that another more sadness of Spartan was already on the move through the way our history and historiography fell into the hands of amateurs and unreliable, unknowledgeable historians who lacked material and data. Many uh, books which were translated from English into Arabic, we find them in the shelves of our libraries. They were mostly written by explorers and amateurs who came in here at the beginning of the, uh, of, of the 20th century, towards the end of the 19th century, writing journals and diaries, and they were with time considered as sources of historical data, but of course, uh, they lack uh, much uh, scientific uh, basis. Another point, which is maybe towards the decolonization of the uh, Algeria's archival history is to contextualize Algeria's history through giving space, and this is the problem in writing or engaging with Algeria's history, is that no space or very little space was given to the local or indigenous and oft marginalized narratives like public histories and ethnographic materials. Much, they are much required venue to bring things back to track. For example, studying about the Algerian revolution, the only account we can find they are those which were written by the colonial enterprise in Algeria. That's why the only possible account about the Algerian revolution, for example, which Algerians inherited and studied at school is the one written down outside the Algerian border. And this is a big issue, of course, that needs much reflection in it. While the real actors during the revolution had their accounts buried with them, this is very metaphorical, but it means so much, is that many accounts by the Mujahideen or by the martyrs and their families and their local villages, and they were not really brought to the fore. And many museums, which were built after independence, they kind of, a house, a data, which does not say much about the accuracy of the revolution or uh, what was in there. So local original history within the country is equally represented in the form of museum crafts, which go back to the last years of the colonial era with very little known about what was beyond the time these museums came into existence. There are many recent attempts on the part of doctoral students of history to investigate or rewrite local histories in different regions of the country through taking into account public histories, local narratives, historical memory of the region, individual testimonies, search for records and ancient writings with the hope that this can escalate to cover the history of the whole country. The last point in here is that a step that needs to be made forward in, in an attempt to decolonize the archive of history of Africa is that there is also an urgent need for widening the scope of historical intellection to first give a possibility to the new emerging voices in academia. And this is an issue in here. It's not easy for an Algerian academic to engage in writing or rewriting Algerian history. He has to account for politics, he has to account for, for historical memory, he has to account for the, the public history, he has to account for archives, whether he can kind of consult them or he cannot consult them. We don't know any, any kind of uh, any venue we can take as academics to consult the archival history. Um, in order for them to these emerging forces in academia to share in the task of knowledge production and dissemination, and second, to free it from the manipulation of the elite. Elitism in telling history also is a problem in Algeria. For decades now, rewriting Algeria's history was under the monopoly of people who belong to the old school of historiography, both colonial and post-colonial, whose efforts to embrace a more scientific study of historical archives or innovate or update its Research methods are so scarce to be mentioned. Also, the public discourse has to be considered in the process of writing Algeria's history. Much was noticed, especially with the beginning of the Algerian mo movement, maybe uh, you know or you are, about, uh, you are aware of this. The Algerian Hirak or, or popular movement of February the 22nd, 2019, about the interest of young people, different associations and cultural groups in raising awareness about the need of redrawing the general image of Algeria's history, apart from the accounts owned by the colonial score or those propagated by first media venues. So despite the influence of globalization and the alienating impact of meta narratives, this growth in consciousness on the part of Algeria's youth about the importance of learning about one's past 
was primarily motivated, according to many commentators, by the wide range of historical falsification, which target both the existence and accuracy of an Algerian history in different discussion platforms, especially in, 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 in France, after the recent upsurge in the question of the skulls of the uh, revolution martyrs, which were uh, brought back to uh, Algeria and the tales created about them. So as I conclude the remark in here, because there is much to be said in here, but I have to be confined to time, is that um, decolonizing both the archives and university history curricula in Algeria was held was or is still hotly debated among writers and academics on various academic scientific occasions, with many showcasing the desire to engage more objectively with the nation's historical memory. Many are seeking governmental support to lay open the hidden or to what was made to be forgotten as an essential step for them to act more responsibly towards a history whose frames, shifts, and parameters have always been subject either to manipulation, theft, or misrepresented. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and now we move um, finally to the last of the papers in this panel um, and to Bennett Brazelton, who is a 10th grade history teacher um, in Boston Public Schools and an independent scholar. His research focuses on education, black studies and anti-colonial thought and history. And his work is accepted or forthcoming or published in Philosophy and Global Affairs, Cultural Geographies, FIRE, the Multimedia Journal of Black Studies, Radical Teacher, the Educational Forum, and Radical Americas. And the title of the paper is On the Erasure of Black Indigeneity. Over to you. Thank you. I always forget to start my timer, so I'm going to start it now. Um, thank you, uh, everybody, for coming. Uh, I wasn't able to at uh, attend the full panel because I had my 10th grade class. Um, but I just managed to get out of it uh, for the presentation. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I, I have to uh, say at the outset that this research doesn't uh, deal quite as directly in intellectual history, but I'm hoping that, um, that, the, that the implications will still be relevant for those dealing with the archive and with particularly anti-colonial thought. Um, and so this paper is entitled On the Erasure of Black Indigeneity, um, which to me immediately signals, you know, it's rooted very much in the Americas, um, in the American context. Uh, and what I hope to demonstrate is that a lot of the problems that I'm addressing are a product of particular United States centric ways of thinking about identity. Um, and so what I mean by that is summarized uh, at the outset by uh, the historian Carter G. Woodson, who wrote as early as 1920, uh, one of the longest unwritten quote, one of the longest unwritten chapters in the history of the United States is that treating of the relations of the Negroes and the Indians. And in the century and one year since he published that, there's still really the same problem. Um, there have been a few historical treatments by scholars like Gary Nash, Daniel Littlefield, Jack Forbes, uh, William Loren Katz and Tia Miles. Um, and these have offered really promising entry points into this discussion. There's also a uh, forthcoming book that's gonna be out this upcoming November called, um, I believe an Afro-Indigenous History of the United States by Kyle Mays. Um, but on the whole, the, the engagement, not just with the history, but with the sociology and uh, the engagement between Black and Native studies remains limited. What, what does it mean to be Black and what does it mean to be Native in a political context? And how do we frame anti-colonial movements from that set of terms? And so what this shows is a larger tension between politics of indigeneity and diaspora. This is true with social movements and this is true with the political process of writing history. Um, and the former, a politics of indigeneity is one that's inherently rooted in rootedness, right? It derives its legitimacy from being a prior, original, never having moved, like, identity, right? It's not displaced, it's, it's original, it's in the words of uh, Leanne Simpson, uh, as we have always done, right? An indigenous politics uh, is a politics of rootedness. And this is clear in some of the really foundational studies in Native American, uh, Native American thought like uh, Vine Deloria's Custer Died for Your Sins and George Manuel's The Fourth World, an Indian Reality. 
Um, on the other hand, a politics of diaspora is seems to be the opposite. It's brought, it's something that's derives from displacement, exile, and dislocation. And it's seen in works like Stuart Hall's Cultural Identity and Diaspora and George Lamming's uh, book, which is aptly titled The Pleasures of Exile. It's a politics that derives its legitimacy from not being in an original place. Um, and so like Brent Hayes Edwards tells us, we need to consider, as he calls it in his titular paper, the uses of diaspora. And we also need to consider the uses of indigeneity as well. Um, and from this, there's a kind of contradiction between uh, a politics of rootedness and a politics of displacement. So the consequence of this contradiction is that the terms upon which anti-colonial activity takes place actually come into question. Does anti-colonialism occur through a model that continually challenges claims to land? Or does it take place on a model that actually asserts the inherent sovereignty of original inhabitants? And is there a way to negotiate both of those things? And so a rigorous inquiry into anti-colonial anti thought and intellectual history requires thinking through the construction of the terms underlying anti-colonial activity. Um, this is what, you know, I can refer to Sylvia Winter's paper, uh, 1492, A New Worldview, where she calls for what we could call a discursive history into the symbolic order of the world. Right, not just what happened and who did what, but what does it mean to be as they as people were? Right, what are the terms? Uh, she looks specifically at the construct of race. Um, what are the terms that form the basis upon which anti-colonial activity can take place? Um, and so, in approaching what seems to be an unbridgeable divide between rootedness uh, and exile, I look historically and contemporarily at Black indigeneity. Um, and what I argue for are three dimensions of Black indigeneity that I feel um, are transferable to a lot of different contexts where there are both struggles by Indigenous people and struggles by diasporic people. Um, and the dimensions I argue for are first, um, just the historical cohabitation and filiation between diasporic and native people, right? So in this case, black native people. Um, and that includes uh, communities like the Cherokee Freedmen, Garifuna, um, and a lot of different communities throughout the Americas that both have native descendants and black descendants. Um, second, I argue for an understanding of um, displaced people as indigenous to somewhere. In this case, black people who were displaced by the slave trade as displaced indigenous Africans, right? Um, and then the third dimension I introduce or, or build from, especially the work of Sylvia Winter, is the question of indigenization or what does it mean to become indigenous to a place? Um, and I don't assert that any of these are fact. I'm not saying that people have to, have to view indigenous politics in any prescriptive way. But what I do think is that if we want a rigorous inquiry into what it means to be rooted or what it means to be displaced, we have to contend with these ideas. Um, and so in this paper, what I do is I outline these three ideas. I talk about some of the limitations of, of current scholarship. Um, but what I hope to do here is just briefly outline what I mean by each of these three, three dimensions of Black indigeneity. Uh, so the first dimension which is obscured is the rich history an enduring presence of communities with mixed African and native ancestry. Um, and often this is even more than just those two, especially in the Caribbean. Um, and scholars have largely ignored the cultural mixture between African and native American peoples, in spite of the ubiquity of black native communities across the Americas. Um, this includes, like I said, Cherokee Freeman, Choctaw, Shinnecock, and Wampanoag in the US, as well as large communities of Afro Mixtecos in, uh, in Mexico, Tainos and Garifunas, uh, to name only a few communities across the Americas. Um, so the question becomes, what does it mean to center black natives in discussions of settler colonialism and chattel slavery? This includes both Africans who fled to or were enslaved by native nations, as well as natives who were coerced into plantation slavery. So 
what does it mean to consider the native ancestry of Frederick, uh, Frederick Douglass, right? Who's always seen to be a black figure. Or what does it mean to consider the blackness of Vicente Guerrero, uh, who was one of the founders of uh, uh, Mexican independence? Um, and we could also ask this question broadly, what does it mean to think of Frantz Fanon as a South Asian intellectual? His father was, was uh, a South Asian migrant to the Caribbean. What is, how does that change our perspective of how we frame his work? Not just a black Atlantic, but also something a lot more complicated. Um, and beyond the immediate evidence of racial mixture, there's expansive but subtle cultural exchange. Um, so for instance, in the Afro-Brazilian religious traditions of Candomblé, Catimbo, and Umbanda, uh, you see a lot of caboclo spirits, uh, which are spirits of native Brazilians who are regarded as ancestors and owners of the land. So here you have an Afro-Brazilian religion, which is incorporating Native American cosmology. And this is true also in the case of Haitian Vodou. This is true in the case of root work. This is true in the case of many, if not most, Africana religious traditions in the Americas. Um, and one anthropologist, Maya Darren, wrote as, as early as 1953, uh, quote, it is doubtful whether any two other uh, when it is doubtful whether any other two peoples of different racial and continental origins could have discovered such an astonishing coincidence of religious beliefs, not only in basic pattern, but in basic ritualistic and even accessory detail. But the idea of mixture is not convenient to discourses of diaspora or indigeneity, which both rely on a kind of purity either purely rooted or purely displaced. Consequently, black native history is dismissed or swept to the side and the unique subjectivity is erased. Uh, and John Brown Childs, uh, who is um, Native American and black describes this subjectivity he says, quote, I do not feel like one of those crossing border hybrids now so much discussed by scholars who examine post-modernity, nor does the older Latin American term Zambo for half black, half Indian describe how I know myself. It is not in such a divided fashion that I recognize my existence. To the contrary, in the language of my Algonquin ancestors, I am a man who stands at the place between two strong currents. Without these distinct streams, there can be no such in-between place to be named as such. But at the same time, this place is real and complete unto itself. Uh, the second dimension I wanna talk about is uh, the indigeneity of Africans. Uh, as Robin Kelly argues, if we describe a colonial regime as settler native slave or settler native diasporic other, we have already presupposed the non-indigeneity of that enslaved other. As Kelly argues, quote, African indigeneity is erased in this formulation because through linguistic sleight of hand, Africans are turned into black Americans. And it's evident that African culture has been maintained despite the violence of colonization and slavery. A cursory look at Africana religious traditions, music, foodways, art, aesthetics, and political movements demonstrates the persistence of African culture and people in the diaspora. Um, but this endurance of Africana culture uh, poses an analytical challenge to certain notions of settler colonialism and indigenous theory, which argue that to be indigenous, you have to be where you were historically from, right? Um, if, as some posit, indigeneity is to be understood as strictly site-specific, how do we understand the displacement of African peoples into diaspora? And what's more, how do you understand the displacement of Native American people in diaspora, of which there is a massive Native diaspora in Australia and Canada, uh, even within the United States? Uh, we could consider the, the Trail of Tears, which displaced uh, particularly Cherokee people to the Oklahoma Territory, an act of displacement. Um, so there's a kind of question that, that, that comes up, like what is, the, what is the relationship when native people enter diaspora? Um, and so the analytical issues produced at the intersection of mobility, diaspora, and indigeneity come to a head. What happens when return isn't possible? What happens when the displacement of peoples is so thorough that no precise homeland is even identifiable uh, when there are many possible homelands? What happens when the return of a diaspora becomes its own site of settler colonialism, which is true in the case of Israel and Liberia? Uh, 
What happens when return is not possible for two generations or for 20? How can those new roots, uh, connections, births, and burials be, config uh, be configured within a binaristic account of colonial power that is settler and native? These questions demand a vocabulary that exceeds binaries, and more specifically, an account of how relationships with space, place, and land are formed and deformed. And so what I wanna leave off with is this last question, how are relationships formed? Um, and so in the case of the Blant, uh, Black Atlantic world, the Jamaican philosopher and cultural critic, Sylvia Winter offers a particular approach, which however imperfect must be contended with. In her seminal paper, Jankanu in Jamaica, Winter articulates Afro-Caribbean ethnogenesis as a kind of indigenization. She writes, and I'm quoting, the more total alienation of the new world Negro has occasioned a cultural response, which has transformed the New World Negro into the indigenous habitant, inhabitant of his new land. His cultural resistance to colonialism in this new land was an indigenous resistance. Uh, indigenous resistance. Now, the issue with this is Sylvia Winter completely. She argues that you know native people were eliminated; they're gone; they're not in the picture. Which, of course, is part of the project of settler colonialism to erase native people. Um, but at the same time, we still have to consider the fact that uh, Black communities, especially in the Caribbean, experience and resist colonialism as indigenous, though they may not be Aboriginal, right? Um, when the United States invaded Haiti in 1915 and the Dominican Republic in 1916, Marines didn't distinguish between Taino and Black people. Everyone was the native. Um, and so, while Black people may initially have been regarded as non-Indigenous chattel transported to a, replace a rapidly perishing Native workforce, Black people have been reconfigured as Native to the extent that they can stand in as Native inhabitants for colonial violence. Um, and so part of the work, and I'll, I'll wrap up real quick, part of the work of decolonizing archives and rethinking canons involves rethinking the terms and foundations upon which archives and canons are, con are constructed. Much of what is taken for granted as a stable identity category is in fact much more complex and heterogeneous. This is part of the intellectual project of creoliz uh, creolization articulated by Jane Anna Gordon. And I'm quoting, creolization has referred to distinctive ways in which opposed unequal groups forged mutually instantiating practices in contexts of radical historical rupture. Because creolization gener generally focuses on collective ends beyond those of basic coexistence and toleration, it draws attention to the mutual transformation involved in molding that which emerges as politically shared. Um, so I will leave off there. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, and so let me now pass over to Miles, who's going to give some um, discussant comments on the three papers we've had, and then I will say something briefly about Miles's paper, and then we'll open up to questions. So over to you, Miles. Great. <clears throat> thank you very much, and thank you to all the other speakers for really interesting papers, um, <clears throat> none of which I'm an expert in, and none of which I'm going to sort of try and answer in very, uh, or, or address in very specific um, terms. Um, what I thought was really impressive is that each of them is making a contribution here that is addressing in one way or another one of the central um, possibilities, challenges or dilemmas of the decolonization of history or intellectual history. And for Ben's purposes, I'm not that worried about defining specifically what is intellectual history as opposed to other kinds of history here. Um, variously, in his case, the question of how you overcome the legacies of colonial violence and division while being aware of the historical impact of that violent div divisiveness for contemporary societies and identities. Um, in Kadeja's case, the dilemmas of researching and teaching national or even national histories in ways that challenge and don't replicate all the problematic aspects of national histories as they have existed, as they have developed in the West and, and been imposed in some cases on the non-Western world. And questions of pursuing freedom and liberation in ways that don't simply impose uh, 
uh, in searching for liberation, a hegemonic liberal form of Western identity on both present day and historical liberation movements. And I think underlying all these papers is the kind of question about what is history for? What is the use of history in uh, contemporary movements of decolonization and in our writing the history of movements of uh, liberation, struggle uh, and freedom. Um, just, just some comments, I think, really on each of the papers in turn. As we've heard, Ben Brazelton's paper really raises, I think, profound questions about this notion of indigeneity um, and its impact on and, and, and questions of African-American and Native American identities and political relationships. I learned a lot here about this. Um, I certainly think this concept is one that's fraught with contradictions um, and has certainly the potential to divide communities which might otherwise make common cause. One of the things I was constantly thinking about then was origin stories. One of the many societies in Central Africa tell a story of origin through migration. Um, we were in a place, we came to a new place. That journey was difficult, hazardous, um, and we defined ourselves not by the place we came to be, but by the journey we made. Um, so, you know, the, 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 what colonialism, of course, then does to those communities is fix them in place, strip away a history of migration, strip away a capacity for mobility as a way of turning them into tribes, um, rooting, giving limited rights in, a, in belonging, but stripping away everything else. And simultaneously, rendering peoples like the Khoisan in South Africa and, and Botswana or the Batwa in Uganda as pre-modern um, because not settled agriculturalists and therefore rendered landless and in a sense illegitimate. Um, there's a whole post-colonial history of, of the price that's paid by seeking liberation through nationhood, um, through um, self-rule, um, through, through the kind of international insistence on national liberation. Um, that flows out of that. Today, in Africa and other parts of the world, we see increasing conflict between settled agriculturalists and mobile pastoralists. And one of them is this kind of continued insistence by authorities everywhere on the attribution of political rights via fixed territorial identity, um, which have a, 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 if you like, an ethnic version, but also a national one. Um, so I really like the way you argued about this. I think the, the idea of, uh, particularly that point about the issue of claiming native rights not being at the consequences of excluding the native rights or indigenous rights of others. Um, I wonder about whether indigeneity is itself the right direction of all of this. I was thinking about the term belonging and whether that does other things. As you might know, the South African constitution has the phrase in it, South Africa belongs to all those who live in it. And it's a lovely liberal declaration of universal rights that has done precisely nothing to prevent periodic outbursts of xenophobic violence. So there's something about how you find a notion, here's, here's my impossible question for you to answer, how do you find a notion of indigeneity that is that enables oppressed peoples to make common cause while equally recognizing different, different origin stories two different versions of versions of indigeneity. Um, Khadija's paper on the crisis of Algerian intellectual history, I think is heartfelt and represents in a very clear way the dilemmas facing um, any group of, of, of historians and academics um, in universities um, and, and, and intellectual spaces that have been profoundly affected by the historical experience of colonialism and post-colonialism and how one avoids Fanon again the pitfalls of national consciousness in writing such histories. I think that in some of your very specific detail that you drew out you clearly are pointing some of the ways forward here. I was thinking about the phrase intellectual reparations perhaps as a way of considering this and whether um, in uh, the, the, the physical movement of archives uh, from Paris to Algiers, from colonial centre, uh, Western imperial centres to colonial, uh, sorry, to, to uh, non-Western archives, you see some uh, possibilities of, of hope in that regard. Um, and what other, and, and certainly the writing of local histories 
um, that aren't simply designed to be component parts of a fixed um, sort of national history in that regard. Um, but I think, you know, the real difficulty is working out what an overall solution looks like here. Um, battles over history curricula, in schools in particular, to some extent in universities, have occurred in many post-independence political environments, um, precisely because it's, it's unsurprising that an FLN controlled government would seek anything other than a patriotic version of recent Algerian history. Um, I then did come away with the question whether crisis is such a terrible thing um, and whether a stable Algerian intellectual history is really what you wish to see. I know that the circumstances in ex-colonial powers like Britain and France is different, but I think there is, um, there is struggle uh, and there is contestation of what school curricula and university curricula are these days, inspired by, of course, movements like Black Lives Matter and Rose Must Fall. Um, and I would not see the desirable outcome of those processes as a sort of stable one, but rather one in which struggle continues uh, and which contestation continues. But I would be interested in how you would um, think about that, um, what would be a desirable outcome in an Algerian context. And um, GVGK's paper, I think, raises really powerful questions about the, the power of history to emancipate but also exclude. Um, in criticizing the terminology and historiography of Western gay history, um, problematizing uh, taken for granted norms of what I think you usefully term non normative eroticism. Um, I think there's an excellent historical account here, um, which I think speaks for itself. Just one or two points in relation to this. I thought the, there's something very interesting about what history does for different contemporary um, non-normative gay, queer, LGBTQ movements in, in different countries. So for example, while the history of Western, conventional Western male Gay liberation here is one from um, repression and illegality, as you presented, towards liberation. What I think is happening in many parts of sub-Saharan Africa is um, in the face of contemporary repression, um, precisely along the argument that gay identity or gay practice is itself a Western construct imposed um, or exported, um, the argument that many Africanist governments and evangelical churches make is that the discovery in the historical record of sexual activities, same-sex activities, uh, and so on that are legitimate and non-pathological or not criminalized in the past is precisely itself liberatory. It, it, in order to um, find those identities in the past, finding those identities in the past gives the legitimacy to contemporary um, sexual activists, shall we say, um, that is extremely different to um, those, uh, the liberal Western ones that you've identified. And I think that's a very interesting and very contrasting sort of way of approaching the history. Someone whose work I think has been useful for me in thinking about this is Patrick Fikawondo, who writes about um, sexual movements um, in uh, Cameroon in particular. And there he draws, I think, a clear distinction, which I think was there in, partly in your paper between um, sexual behavior and sexual identity um, that we've seen, a, you can see a kind of conflation in some Western writing between, for example, um, effeminacy as a, or, or sort of um, non heteronormative um, displays of identity and um, sexual behavior. And, and he talks very specifically about movements that identify, for example, men who have sex with men. In other words, a focus on sexual behavior, uh, delineating that from, um, for example, um, alleged effeminacy, for example. Um, and so a sort of divide, uh, questioning the uh, assumed relationship between behavior and identity, um, and whether that's something which you would find useful or or not in some of the research that you're doing. But thank you to all three of you. <laughs>
great. So just before we, we move on to questions, I'll, I'll just say something very, very quickly, um, so I'll leave plenty of time for questions about um, Miles's paper, um, which was, you know, it was really wonderful um, to get that insight into, you know, what I think is going to be a really uh, important book when it's published. I think it's, this is really, really exciting um, and speaks so directly um, to the themes of this panel, to that question of how we might reimagine archives and methodologies um, of intellectual history. Um, and really creative ways that, that you've been doing that in this project. Um, I thought the idea of intellectual ecologies was particularly um, helpful and, and, and exciting um, as a way of, 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 of approaching these questions. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, <laughs> if, uh, the current situation Britain tells I think it's a track and trace doesn't necessarily work. So uh, intellectual ecologies is, uh, is a great way forward. Um, so I guess I just had a, a few kind of questions and, and reflections that um, that the presentation prompted. Um, I mean, one one was I think one of the things that's really exciting about your project is the way that you cross national borders. So you know, again, thinking about this panel as, as partly um, uh, inspired by the way that we've been questioning um, categories of, of the nation and the modern, um, and you're able to, to to think across this region. Um, and I wondered about um, how far you found differences in terms of conceptions of where intellectual authority lies um, and of you know the, the role of the social scientist um, in between the, the different case studies. How, how far is there a, a, a sort of mid 20th century set of ideas about what that role should be and how far is it actually um, delineated across national or earlier um, imperial lines? Um, and I guess the, 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 the kind of question that, um, that is always provoked when, and you, it was very interesting at the end when you talked a little bit about your sources um, and the, the, the huge variety of, of sources that you've got. Um, but, and I thought you, you, you gave a really good case of you know, how it is that actually reproducing this narrative isn't simply the dominance of a hegemonic narrative, this is a narrative which is shaped through exchange um, and is, is co-produced effectively. But did you, in, in the sources that you had access to, hear the, the, the kind of counters, the, the hidden voices, the things that unsettle? Um, you know, and I'm thinking of um, people like David Gordon's work, I think you possibly alluded to right at the beginning, um, when spirits are active in ways that, that might not be anticipated. Um, or, for example, in some of Stephanie Lemmett's um, petitions, where um, things take place that um, the, the, uh, the bureaucrats <laughs> sort of uh, trying to deal with this just can't make sense of? What do you do with the incommensurable? And were your sources able to, did you hear those in your sources and, uh, or, or, or can we just not get at those quite? And I suppose that then the kind of the, the question that follows from that is that big point you made about social history and, and social histories of Africa. Um, and the, the point which I think is very well taken that maybe we need to, you know, rather than think there is an authentic, pure social history sort of beyond the text, as it were, that actually this is constituted, this is the social history, it's constituted um, in these spaces. Um, and you've obviously our discussions here around um, futures of intellectual history, what this means for, for writing intellectual history. But what does your work, what, what, what are the implications of this for what it means to write social history? Is it that we are all intellectual historians now um, or does it also indicate a way forward um, to, to take the, the discipline of, of social history forward or, or is that simply not? Uh, <laughs> is, is social history uh, a 20th century phenomenon to be archived with the social scientists um, and, uh, and we need new methodologies today. Uh, so those, those were my brief thoughts and I, I'll stop there. Um, so um, Shivaji, should, we, should uh, the panellists all have a chance to briefly respond to, to Miles and to me and then we have wider questions? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, who should we go in backwards order this time? Um, perhaps um, Bennett, do you want to to go first? Sure. Yeah. Um, oh boy. Uh, <laughs> I think the the question. If I if I I took down like some real bad notes um, during it, but uh, just uh, thinking about indigeneity as a direction for political movements and and the potential ramifications that come with that. Um, I think that there, I don't 
think there's anything particularly threatening about the notion of indigeneity. Um, I think that there's a there's an issue that there's the potential for any kind of discourse of indigeneity to become indigenous. Well, not necessarily indigenous, but nativist, right? Um, ironically, the most nativist people on earth are, you know, settlers. Like, like white Americans, white South Africans are the most nativist people on earth and assert claims to belong more than anybody. The French in Algeria are the exact same way, right? Like, like who tries to assert their belonging more um, than really white Europeans, right? Um, and so I don't think the idea of indigeneity is a problem, but I do think that it has to be a lot more flexible than um, how certain people, how it oftentimes is framed, which is that we have an idea of what it means to belong imported from Europe, which is the nation state. And so if a, if a, a, a community doesn't fit within that model of a sovereign polity, if they're, for instance, nomadic, then all claims to indigeneity or claims to access land that is sacred and that they do belong to is, is uh, vacated, right? So I think that the, the issue is that, and, and part of what, I'm, what I get at, at the paper is um, black indigenous people are erased from being indigenous by virtue of being black in the United States, the, uh, like the, the, the legal foundation, there were myriad court cases of uh, whether a child's mother was black or native, because if they were uh, black, then they would be enslaved, even though they had a native father, right? Um, so part of the issue is that uh, we've, we've restricted who can be indigenous. And like you said, we've relegated indigenous people to this pre-modern understanding uh, that traps people in a, particularly, a particular kind of stasis, right? For an indigenous person to use a cell phone then, like what kind of contradiction does that introduce? Like indigenous people are not allowed to respond to the world and innovate themselves because it's seen as an inherent corruption of their indigeneity and therefore a reason to strip them of land rights. And so I think that at its core, the issue isn't, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, and in fact, it's important to, to, to you know, be clear that right now indigenous people are being killed to get access to their land. And so that's a, that's a legitimate dimension of the struggle that, that I don't wanna like complicate away. At the same time, I think that, um, and I don't think that this is an issue in activist movements um, where indigenous and black solidarity is like a fact, um, like a constant fact, but I think it's more an issue with certain intellectual trajectories that have asserted a static identity of what it means to be native and of what it means to be black. In other words, I think this is kind of almost a fiction of the academy more so than any struggles that are occurring on the ground. Um, and I, I'll leave it there to, to leave time for others. Great, could you take? Yeah, uh, thank you so much. So, uh, so the question was that, um, talking about a crisis, so crisis is not always something bad, of course, uh, Professor, Professor Miles, yeah, because when we say crisis, many things go to emerge behind the crisis that made us, that make us understand that kind of, open our eyes into things we did not understand before. So the more we contemplate how web things are overlapping or complicated, we still, there is something there to understand, there is something there to, uh, to kind of to identify with. So why this um, idea of the crisis right in African, uh, sorry, Algerian history means so much to me as a person, because I'm a person who, Algerian individual belongs to the generation of the 90s. Uh, I'm still young, I want to understand many things. Uh, school did not provide us with, it did not satisfy our desire to understand really what was in there, what is there to learn, what is there. Um, so we, we are not questioning authenticity, we are not questioning kind of uh, a huge, uh, a huge kind, kind of like their shelves, but we want to understand that is something there 
we can identify with, something there we can teach, something there we can approve, something there we can write about, something there we can see or we can say that it is there, something that's called Algerian history. Uh, however, um, if you can say the accurate it is, or whoever is responsible for uh, writing something or, or uh, giving the public something to understand, this is not really a concern for the younger generation. The younger generation is much more interested in knowing what is, what is in here, why we are not allowed to tell something about the story that connects us all as a, a past and as present subjects. And we are still living as, as, as neo-colonial subjects, people who, uh, who are still so much tied politically, economically, linguistically to an ex-colonial power. And things are getting much more complicated with time. And with every new crisis we get faced with, all of these kind of uh, historical parameters that link us to a colonial past come to the scene and to give us a kind of uh, a new, uh, a new, a new questionings and new ideas about why uh, or why do we need to decolonize? Why do we need to have our uh, version of historiography? Why do we need to have our school uh, from which we can write, from which we can embark uh, in our uh, story of writing? And this is very, uh, very um, kind of very relevant. Why? Because the better question of who is indigenous and who is an Arab and whether we are really Arabs or we are Arabized. And these very cultural problems between the, the, those who are originally Berbers and whether Tamazigh as a language should be national language or not. And whether, and me, for example, um, whether I'm, I'm an Arab, Arabized Arab or originally Berber, we don't have much, much kind of, uh, kind of uh, credence or information about this. So in here, the more we are getting with time, more questions are coming to the scene and very little data is provided in there for us at least to consult or to see. So it is crisis, it's very fine, but a crisis that needs to be responded to, that needs to be at least to understood, at least to be kind of uh, dissociated for something there to emerge, to give sense and uh, to give shape. So uh, it's not really about authenticity or uh, who is the real actor in telling the story as it is in the importance of people who want to be aware, who want to be conscious of what was in there and what they can teach their kids maybe or future generations about what was really in there uh, and what's the uh, story. So the desirable under outcome is, maybe I'm speaking about from the viewpoint of, of, of a post-colonial subject is understanding, locating oneself somewhere from which to approach the, uh, the, 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 the journal phenomena. So um, uh, people are uh, presenting many questions about the time, for example, the very first Jewish people came in here, whether they are Arabs or they are not Arabs, whether the uh, Christians are truly or originally Arabs or they are Berbers, what kinds of churches and which places should be built, whether in the place uh, or in the region where more indigenous people are in there, or in the region that connects all communities together, which is kind of uh, regionally diverse and culturally diverse, which means that the more we move uh, in, in, in time, more questions of the same type, but with more uh, complicated version come into the scene or find ourselves as, as students of history. Sometimes I, I don't have the, the exact answer to give to my students in class. I find myself in a crisis. So it is a crisis. It is, uh, it is an in-betweenness. It is a lack, of, a, lack of, a lack of knowledge, a lack of... That's why my, my, my research in here or my paper is rather investigative. It's a rather contemplative, a paper that wants to bring things to the fore more than proposing things, even though I have, I have some ideas about, in mind about how we can decolonize things or how we can uh, engage or give more to, uh, to people, but still, I think that understanding and consciousness and making aware of one's standing is the desirable outcome that I want to see as uh, a young uh, a young person, as uh, a person who was not really uh, aware of his actual history. Great, thank you very much for that answer. Um, Shivachi, I'm conscious we've only got five minutes left. So I'm wondering, should we feed the, the questions in the chat? There's one to um, GV, GK, Tang, and there's a couple to Miles, and then they can answer those as well as the, the questions from the discussant. Is that okay? Um, do you want to read out the, the question that was there for GV, GK, Tang? Uh, 
So uh, this is from one of our audience, uh, Aishwarya Dr. Roy. Uh, she asks, I would like to pose my question to GVG Ketan and uh, would request, uh, yeah, sorry. In India, we're straddling with similar issues of the hegemonic imposition of the English language over localized gender fluid and gender non-binary identities at the intersections of caste, class, and geocultural spaces. How would you consider to be a way out of solving this global north versus global south conundrum, if any, with regard to the diverse gender and sexual identities. Yeah. Thanks for to unmute. Um, so I think I'll go with uh, Professor um, Miles' uh, questions first, because um, I think it segues neatly into the um, guest question. Uh, you mentioned gay identity as a Western export. Um, it's a very similar issue um, in China and Hong Kong. Um, in other research, I've actually talked about how uh, fraught the origins of the Tongzi movement in Hong Kong were uh, because the push to decriminalize sodomy was um, attributed to the demise of a closeted Scottish police officer um, and was treated as the colonial government's agenda to serve white gay elites. Um, it was up to Chinese Tongzi activists to contest that, um, among other complications. Um, and then you also talked about kind of like um, orientation or rather behavior and identity. Um, in a longer version of my paper, um, I actually took the time to define sexuality uh, by breaking it out into three categories. Um, they're not definite, but they're definitely useful to consider um, orientation, um, to be thought of as inner thoughts and desires, um, external behavior, um, as you mentioned, and then private and public identities as an articulation of one's experiences. Um, as for uh, the guest question, it's a really great question. Thank you so much. Um, I don't think there's one right answer um, because these um, experiences and identities belong to um, people of a given context. Um, I think this connects well to my discussion of Tongzi versus queer identities. Um, local knowledges may be reclaimed um, or coalesce with a colonial context. Um, there are hybrid identities, there are indigenous identities, and then there are colonial identities that may be critically adapted and subverted. Um, and I think it's from this diversity or the mass of it all um, that these strategies um, help um, form these answers um, that really just emerge from contested and contradicting narratives. And I think that this theme actually ties in with everyone's paper that um, colonized peoples aren't a monolith and that there is no such thing as an objective history because multiple subjective truths can help topple these authoritative or elitist narratives. Great, thank you. Um, Shivaji, I'm conscious we've got one minute left. Um, Eva Shulbrook has a question. Does she have time to ask that or do we have to finish? I uh, think so. we need to wrap up now because the next one is going to be Yeah, it's a bad thing that I'm that person, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm sure Eva can follow up with Miles um, later. Miles, do you want to say one thing for 30 seconds? <laughs> three or four different questions and I get to duck most of them because I have no time. So that's excellent. <laughs> Um, uh, Bipasha, I wanted to just briefly respond. I think one of the things which wasn't clear from my kind of initial presentation is about the nature of colonial distortion. I, I presented this in a very simplistic colonial knowledge production distorts our understanding of these societies. At the same time, that vast wave of social scientific research revealed lots of very important things and provided a lot of important data um, for both intellectual purposes and political purposes. So to complicate the matter further, deeply problematic colonial oriented knowledge production processes often by accident provide lots of important data information for us and interview lots of people and we can then often reinterpret that data at a later point. So it's where a lot of our archival material comes from. Um, Emma, I think uh, lots of things that I could talk about is something very interesting about um, a Congolese versus a Zambian conception of intellectual authority, which to some extent is somewhat derivative from um, colonial attitudes. Put simply, Belgian colonists thought <clears throat> they were doing something very profound, important, worth documenting, 
and very specific to do with the uplift and civilizing nature of uh, the indigenous people. White Europeans on the Northern Rhodesian Copper Belt thought they were digging holes out of the ground and extracting wealth, and they didn't really care very much. And that has a kind of legacy for, for quite a self-conscious Congolese intellectualism versus a more Zambian, what we might talk about as a kind of English style, pragmatic um, kind of political expression, not the same, but certainly influenced by it. And then in different ways, Melinda's question, um, which he raised in the text about the potential for a subaltern intellectual history, in some respects matches or comes together with the kind of implications for social history here. 30 years ago, when I first went to the Copper Belt, I had a kind of Marxist student training, and I thought I was looking for a kind of African working class, um, ready formed with potential socialistic sorts of ideas. And what I found were storytellers, people who knew I was coming, who had seen European researchers come before, and who knew more or less what these kind of people were for. In other words, there is a subaltern version of intellectual history here, which of course raises the question about whether the subaltern intellectual can speak. Um, but, um, you know, I think that's the possibility here. I think approaching social history with an assumption that our subjects, the subjects of social history, have thought at length about their identity, have experienced uh, discursively representing themselves, and that this is not the first time they have been discovered by researchers or by people in their community, um, are at debt and experienced at producing forms of knowledge, whether intellectual or not, is perhaps less important, is how we need to approach the writing of social history. We do really have to wrap up now. But uh, Miles, if you're happy, I can put you in touch with a couple of other questions that has come in over email and then the conversation can uh, continue to happen. Is that okay? Right, perfect. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you Emma for, uh, for moderating this, to Miles for this wonderful um, sneak peek into the fascinating book and also to the other panelists for joining us. And I hope all of you will uh, also join me for the, for the first round table that we have starting in 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Oh, goodbye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Thank you so much.